um, and it looked, as I say, about the perceptions of libraries with policymakers. It was enthusiastically received and indirectly led to the creation of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access through Libraries, which will meet for the first time here at the IGF on Thursday afternoon. Now, the research from Eiffel showed that in many countries, libraries were being overlooked as development partners. Um, it showed that they were actually under-resourced and underfunded in many places, but actually it showed that national and local decision makers also <laughs> were ready to support libraries as partners for the delivery of development goals. So in the years since then, many of the library groups that work internationally and nationally have continued to focus on this theme of libraries as agents for development. If we agree that we cannot have uh, development without access to information, um, then we're really looking at libraries as perfect partners in that equation. We would be fantastic to help governments and technology companies deliver their development goals. Um, and of course, digital inclusion is a major goal of many governments around the world. Now, public access to the internet through libraries, of which there are about uh, 230,000 around the world, and also other community centers, is a way to ensure that the benefits of the internet are not missed by those unable to afford uh, internet-connected devices. So this workshop seeks to build on last year's debate and bring it back to the IGF. Um, we're going to have a panel with representatives from all stakeholder groups that will go a little bit further into the relationship between public access intermediaries like libraries uh, and also community centers, but uh, the relationship between those institutions and policymakers who want to deliver better services for their citizens and technology companies who of course are essential in this chain of providing internet access. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have much more of a discussion. We're not going to have presentations. We've assembled a, a crack team of panelists uh, with a great deal of expertise that are going to get the conversation rolling. And then we're going to open up the conversation to those of you in the room here. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is quite an interesting uh, a way we're doing it today. You've all got your headphones on. When it comes time for the discussion to open up, we have microphones which can rove the room. Uh, and as always, it would be very good to state your name and who you work for before you respond. So the panelists' full biographies are on the internet. We're not going to go deep into them. I am going to introduce them one by one, just so that you know who they are. On my right is Siri Oswald, who is the Senior Program Officer of the Global Libraries Program uh, of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Next to her is Paul Andre Baran, who is the Honorary Advisor to the Ministry of Communications in Romania. Gentleman here is Sange Kandu, who is a Member of Parliament and the National Council in Bhutan. We have Jamila, uh, Jamila Talibzada, who is the Director of the Presidential Library here in Baku. On my left, fresh from the airport, I think, uh, Olivier Crepin Leblanc, who is the Chair of the ISOC England chapter. On his left, Dejan Svetovic, the Regional Technology Officer of Microsoft for Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and then we have one panelist who couldn't be with us today, Monica Mirena from the Government of Honduras. And very uh, lucky we've had Ari Katz, the Director of the Beyond Access Initiative for Libraries, join us. And we are still waiting on a final panelist. We're hoping he's going to run in at some point, fresh from the airport from Ghana. But that may or may not happen. Uh, and that was Kafui Prebe, who is a representative of tech companies in Ghana. So I'm going to kick off by asking a question of Siri on my right, because the Gates Foundation have been very enthusiastic supporters of public libraries over the last decade. Um, and Siri, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has made a great deal of investments in public libraries. Why do they consider that this investment is important? Thanks, Stuart. That's a great question, and a question that I actually get quite often. And I will actually start by saying that the very first philanthropic investment Bill and Melinda ever made was in public libraries in the United States 15 years ago. So public libraries are a sector that have been near and dear to the Gates Foundation for quite some time. 
the gates foundation believes that in order for people to live healthy and productive lives, they need a variety of elements to be in place and to be supported they need strong health care they need education they need opportunities to earn incomes for their family as someone whose country is waking up today to our election day we believe they need information in order to help their own self-governance we believe that women and girls need to have the same opportunities and choices that boys do as well and all of these have a common element and that is access to information but today we really still see a pretty strong information divide that exists and this information divide exists for a variety of reasons we see technology that is different from different countries that enables people to have access we see a divide in access itself some people are simply not able to get to the technology that would provide access to greater information and finally we see a divide in use how people are actually able to use the information what training they have what skills they have what content is available that's relevant and in their local language so the gates foundation decided 15 years ago that we were going to partner with public libraries there are actually 230,000 public libraries in developing countries around the world these are 230,000 potential development partners with which we can work public libraries are a trusted institution they're open to the public. They have librarians or knowledge workers or library staff who are in place who can help guide people through their information needs. They are trusted in their communities. They know their communities the best. And so we really see that public libraries for us represents the ideal venue to tackle some of these challenging development issues. So picking up on that, that's the perspective from a, from a funder's perspective. Um, I'm interested to know, and one of the goals of this workshop is to take a little, a little bit more of a look at what uh, government's view uh, of this issue is. And Paul, you work as um, an advisor to the Romanian government on some of these issues. Um, obviously, government policies towards increasing access to information um, are central uh, to improving people's lives and I wonder how has that played out in Romania what efforts are the government making there to increase public access to information uh, strange um, good afternoon first off I do not work for the government I, I liaise between the government um, of Romania and and very often with the European Commission um, and so I do have a proximity that most other people don't have with government. Um, but in, in Romania, well, right now, the, the government is concerned with several issues. One of the main issues right now that they're currently struggling with is, is basically white spots, areas where broadband internet doesn't exist. Um, I know that this is an area of investment that they would like to make um, in the near future, between now and, and 2016. They'd like to get the rest of the country covered um, by broadband internet coverage. Uh, the government has invested over the past five years extensively in schools, providing equipment and training for professors and teachers so that pupils could... It, is it working? Yeah, sorry. Um, so that professors and pupils can have um, education as to how to utilize uh, e the equipment and, and, and the benefits of the Internet. Um, and, and more recently, we've had a strong collaboration uh, through the program I work with, uh, which is a libraries program, um, in which the government is looking at ways in which we can help the adult population better understand the benefits of, of the Internet. So. There's an interesting thing there. You mentioned in Romania that, that there are these areas of white spots where broadband isn't quite getting all the way to, to where people need it. And Sange, as a representative of the, the parliament in Bhutan, I'm not totally familiar with Bhutan, but I'm imagining that there's some complex challenges in reaching all members of the population. So how are the policymakers in Bhutan attempting to tackle this issue of public access to information? And is there a role for libraries or other community services there? Uh, thank you. Uh, Bhutan's experience um, with information access, is, uh, as some of you probably know, but um, for the rest of the members here, uh, Bhutan became a democracy in 2008, and uh, so it's a newly promulgated constitution we have, in which we have a provision for access to information as a fundamental right, 
And so the Bhutanese um, case for uh, access to information is really, it really begins from there. Uh, as of now, um, the government has taken up initiatives with the private sector to expand its network coverage and um, we've uh, managed to bring internet connectivity to uh, all administrative centers in the country. That's 205 administrative centers. Uh, but uh, we're yet to go beyond that. There are still some white spots, as uh, Paul mentioned, and uh, we'd like to see that covered. At the same time, uh, while we have connectivity, it's uh, really the quality of connectivity we're really concerned about as well. So we have internet connectivity, but we're really exploring ways of uh, improving it so that people could use it. Uh, one challenge we've faced, however, is um, literacy. Uh, we have the internet connection there, but people do not come and use the these facilities because they're not literate enough to uh, capitalize on that and take advantage of the technology that we have. That's one. Second we've had is um, also uh, internet connectivity provides a platform, but there must be enough content and applications for the locals to be attracted to use that service. And uh, the government's recently launched a government to citizens services initiative. And uh, we've had a couple of services um, services being provided online for the citizens there but it's taking time like I said it's literacy not just literacy in the general sense but um, you know technology literacy as well and uh, these are some of the issues that we're grip grappling with right now in Bhutan a follow-up sort of question which would be um, how do most people in Bhutan access the internet um, do they use the community centers? Is there an increasing amount of handheld? I'm just interested to know how they actually access it. Well, Bhutan's, uh, the trend for growth of handheld uh, machine has, is similar to the rest of the region. It has grown, grown phenomenally. But uh, still a lot of the usage is still on the internet, uh, on the computer. Uh, and also, of course, uh, I said, like I said about the literacy issue. So it sort of limits the number of um, users right now because we still, the good thing is, we have 60% uh, of our population who are very young, and most of them go to school. So uh, as they graduate out of the system, um, there are more internet users there. As for libraries, uh, in the equation, this is something new for us. And the Beyond Access Conference in Washington last, last time, last a few, a few weeks ago was a wonderful opportunity for us to recognize that. Uh, in Bhutan, we have telecenters in the districts. Uh, there are a few right now. This is a pilot test we're doing. And th this is where we have people who are trained with computers sitting there waiting for villagers to come and ask them for their services so that they could, uh, you know, use information off the Internet. So right now what we have is we have a lot of uh, extension offices of the government functionary in the, at the block level where farmers would go and ask information related to health, education, forestry, agriculture. But because they are in different offices, it becomes very inconvenient for the people. So what the telecenter tele is trying to do is bring it all together at one, one window stop where a farmer would come in and be able to access all this information using the person who is trained with uh, information technology. Thank you, Sangay. So you mentioned there um, the Beyond Access Conference in Washington, D.C. last month, and I was at that conference. It was an excellent conference. And Ari, as the director of the Beyond Access Initiative, um, I wonder if you could first of all explain what it is to the people in the room who've never heard of it and then perhaps talk a little bit about where public libraries can contribute to government policies for access to information. So from the library perspective. Thanks Derek. Um, so just uh, briefly about Beyond Access. Uh, it's a coalition of nine organizations and it's supported by the, the Gates Foundation and its purpose is twofold. One is to promote this concept of public libraries as partners for development goals. We think that, uh, as Stuart said, they're a hugely untapped resource uh, in the world now. 230,000 public libraries in the developing world. Um, right now, uh, they're just underused as far as contributing uh, to development goals. And second is to empower libraries to be able to meet that challenge. So uh, libraries um, have traditionally uh, served the purpose of uh, distributing books and providing access to books and obviously in the 21st century that's evolving and so librarians need new capacities to be able to to uh, to partner on on development efforts and and beyond access helps uh, librarians do that um, from from a government perspective uh, what we think public libraries have to offer is completing the question of of how 
So governments uh, around the world, it, it, you know, uh, in the in the Western industrialized world, but in, in the developing world, increasingly are are, are good at producing uh, services uh, online. They they see the, the the efficiencies to be gained by putting uh, government services online. The reduction in corruption, the the access to uh, to more of the population. Um, but often those um, those initiatives are taken without considering how are people going to learn about these services? How are they going to learn how to use them? Where are they going to use them? Um, and public libraries are an institution that have traditionally been about access to information. And so this is the perfect role for them in, in the 21st century. Um, and you know, that's something that many libraries around the world are experimenting with now. And that's something that, that we see as a, a, a huge opportunity for them and a hu really a huge opportunity for governments to maximize the value of the investment they're already making in libraries. Governments pay library salaries, they pay for the, the library buildings, um, uh, but often those, that investment's not maximized and this is a way that, uh, that governments can get more value out of libraries and that citizens can access these services that are available uh, with the existing infrastructure without building anything new. Thanks a lot. You mentioned there, um, how libraries can sort of create that link in accessing government services and Jamila uh, here in Azerbaijan I know you and I have talked a lot over the last two days about what the libraries are doing here so I wonder if you might be able to just talk a little bit about how the public libraries here are implementing government services and what the kind of current state of the system in Azerbaijan is. Thank you. So. For the last several years, uh, rapid advancement is observed in the field of information technologies and uh, today holding of uh, the IGF here in Baku is uh, an evidence of it. Uh, we have a number of directive documents now. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a law, new law on electronic signature and e-documents. Uh, we have new state agency on uh, e-government and uh, action plan for creating e, um, e government uh, and etc but regarding libraries uh, in uh, 2000 uh, 2008 the president issued a decree on um, on adopting national program on development and upgrading libraries now our minister of culture is implementing this program through several years in the framework of this uh, program, majority, and, and to be specific, about 90% of uh, central regional libraries, uh, they've got necessary equipment. Uh, they now have uh, uh, automated uh, library system, so they have uh, internet access. And now they face another task, another challenge to make people to come to libraries for internet to access the internet because readers still um, think that library is a place for keeping books and distributing just books. Uh, so we librarians have a new task to make them, uh, to change their mind, their view of library. So uh, regarding libraries, uh, Ministry of Culture organizes uh, special trainings and I think that after this tra training, libraries, uh, librarians should organize another training for readers, to turn readers into users, not just readers, and users of the library, users of internet, users of facilities that library can give, that modern library can give today. So, um, uh, as a result of implementing this program, uh, if we had uh, about 4,000 public libraries in Azerbaijan before, now we have only uh, 3,000. Uh, small libraries are merging together into one uh, big information center, not just a library. So we're uh, in at the beginning of this uh, way, on the beginning, so uh, that's why uh, we're interested in the experience of uh, developed countries, how they uh, pass this transition period. So this is interesting to me. My job at IFLA is to, to be involved in our outreach and our advocacy work, and that perception problem that you mentioned is key to everything that we do. I think very often in the forums of the IGF, and IFLA also works at WIPO and other UN institutions, very often the question of 
you know, what does a library do? What is the relevance of a library? It comes up again and again, and it's a major thing that we have to tackle. So Olivia, I know you've got a huge amount of experience going back with libraries and also IT, and of course you're coming from the ISOC perspective. You've seen a lot of different ways of putting public access out there, and yet we still know there's a perception problem for libraries. So do we have any relevance now? What cards do we have left to play? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I'll take the uh, headphones off. It's a strange experience. Um, I think that, that libraries definitely have uh, uh, um, something to, to uh, play in the future uh, internet and in the way the internet uh, is uh, expanding. Um, one of the main things about libraries is that they are run by librarians, people who are used to classify information, find the right information. And what is the internet but a giant library that you have out there? Uh, the majority of people arriving on the internet have a real problem in finding the, r the information that they're looking for and um, it's an asset that, that a library has. The, the counseling service that a library can uh, provide is something which um, no commercial provider can provide you with um, because ultimately they're just interested in selling you a connection or getting you to consume another coffee in the coffee shop. Um, but the libraries are actually able to provide you with that counseling. There is also another aspect to it, which is to do with the community building side of things. Communities often uh, engage in uh, libraries and they uh, uh, meet with each other and users can, can learn from each other. Um, the, the third thing is, is the physical access. Um, as we heard uh, earlier, um, there is of course a growth in mobile access uh, out there and in many, many countries around the world, especially in Africa, the highest growth of internet access is via mobile phones however, uh, and mobile devices. However, it's impossible to print uh, from a, a mobile and the interfacing with the real world, which does require uh, paper documents, as we all learned, uh, for those of you that decided to have their visa done over here, needs a printer, needs a scanner in some cases, and these are uh, facilities which libraries are able to provide. And finally, uh, on another thing, um, a bit of historical background. In fact, uh, prior to the World Wide Web existing, prior to Tim Berners-Lee uh, coming up with the uh, browser, the, the web browser and the, the HTML, uh, librarians were very much involved with the development of the internet and had devised services like WAIS, Wide Area Information Service, um, also Archie, uh, Veronica, Jughead, um, you might think it's they were, they were all readers of this uh, of this magazine, but um, all of these were services that librarians were working on in order to be able to classify information. And today, as the internet gets bigger and also multilingual as well, with multiple scripts, um, one big question is whether search engines, standard search engines such as Google, uh, would be able to serve all uh, scripts and all languages in a similar fashion than it does for for English. And I think that libra libraries and librarians have, have a, um, really a, a role to play in this because they know how information can be classified, how it can be annotated, and um, they really are the custodians of the, uh, the giant library uh, that the internet is. Thank you, and I think one of the first things I'm going to do when we're finished here is look up what Jughead was <laughs> and see if I can find out that. Um, that was a very interesting intervention because there's an awful lot of, of aspects to the library contained in there. There's the community building, the physical access, the, the printing. And I want to bring in Dejan from Microsoft Europe, from the private sector. Um, now, you and I have talked on the phone. We've talked about where we agree on public libraries. And we've also talked about the way that they enable access to training and skill development. But I know that you feel that the influence and impact of libraries and community centres can be broader. So what other areas do you think that libraries affect? Um, can you hear me? So nice to speak this quietly and everybody is listening to you. I'm really old. Um, anyway, I was, uh, that's a good question, Stuart, but um, listening to this conversation and listening to the fact that there is 250 plus libraries in the developed world and they are undersourced. Um, I think that we as a community need to do constant evangelizing on, on other benefits and on other areas of impact and influence that libraries can do other than the education, um, knowledge transfer and things like that. And um, when I think about those areas, I think about 
six specific distinctive, distinctive areas. The first one being a social inclusion. So I know that we all speak about digital inclusion in when we speak about the information technologies, but the libraries, the public libraries in a digital way exposed on the internet really can facilitate a big social inclusion of different people in different communities. Because especially in the rural areas where people are excluded, if today, with today's technologies, we are able to bridge that digital divide and bring the information to the people in the rural areas, facilitate the discussion, collaboration between them around the library related topics and material. That's something that we constantly need to bring to the table when we speak to the governments and policy makers in order to really emphasize the importance and that area of influence of the libraries. The second one, obviously me coming from the technology company, is the support for ICT in the communities, right? So being able to uh, bring the information technologies to the people and increase their skills in that arena is something that is very interesting uh, for the governments, especially those governments that are thinking about raising the competitiveness of their countries. The third area is partnerships. I, I come from the technology company and uh, have to say that quite often we when we speak to the governments, we lead in with the technologies. We don't lead, lead in with the solutions. So uh, 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 what I want to say is the concept of libraries to be successful and really adopted, and, the, and if we really want to increase the adoption level of those 250 plus, is to really promote the partnerships. Because technology company delivers the technology, government, people, they can write the policies, but it's really the agencies, the experts that know the benefits and the processes in the libraries and that can work with us from the technology companies to bring those concepts in the, in the digitalized manner. Um, the fourth area, uh, enriching the community life. The communities around the world, they have their development goals no matter where they are, no matter wi what countries. But if we attach those goals and those visions of development of the communities to the purpose, to the very specific purpose of the libraries that are targeting those communities, again, this hugely increases the adoption of the libraries. People skills, you already mentioned, uh, you know, there's librarians that have a counseling skills, they have the consulting skills, and uh, bringing those skills in, in the digitalized world, again, increases the skills and the competitiveness of the people in the communities. And finally, the sixth area, techno technical solutions. Again, I come from technology company. Um, it's all about the internet, but internet has, uh, with its existence, has just generated the need for more of the computing power that can process the information that is held in the libraries. So far, the concept of the digital libraries had been created on premises. They are creating on premises, either in the community, in the government buildings, in the post offices, in telcos, whatever. With the concept of cloud computing, there's no borders. You can have a library in a data center that sits in Dublin and that serves the community in India. And that all exists today. So I think that as a community, we really have the opportunity to evangelize the cloud computing as a concept of complete and total outsourcing, uh, outsourcing of the entire IT infrastructure both hardware and software required for building the digital library, including the people skills for the people that are required to maintain the information technologies and really let the local communities and local librarians focus on what their job is, which is running the library. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot to take in on that one. Um, what I'm going to use as a jumping point, because as I predicted, we've been very lucky to be joined by Kafui Prebe, who literally, I think, ran from the airport to join us here. 
Uh, Kafu is the CEO of TechAid, um, uh, a tech social firm in Ghana. And Kafui, you heard uh, a number of references there to software, hardware in the cloud, but also the skills, IT skills needed to develop people's uh, ability to access information. So I wanted to know from your viewpoint in the private sector, um, what sort of partnerships libraries could generate with the technology sector, with companies there? What sort of partnerships are mutually beneficial? Thank you very much. And thank you for accepting me and running from the airport into the place. It's really, really a lot of energy, but thank you for everything. What we've done in Ghana, for example, is trying to bring our research knowledge and made it available to the libraries. There's always a diminishing cost or value for money that governments don't invest in research for libraries, especially in developing countries. And what our partnership has done for libraries in Ghana and in some parts of Africa is to bring the constant research knowledge that we seek as companies to serve our clients and make those values available to libraries in, in the form of a public-private partnership. What that does to the libraries is it makes them more relevant to the people whose needs they serve. And I'll touch on what he said. For example, the government in Ghana will not do research on how cloud computing will be used for libraries. But of course, that information could be made available because we belong to a set of partnerships called the African Awareness Raising Group funded by ICO. And because of that, we are able to make available such information from our research process, from our meetings of technology companies, and make those, those values available to the libraries. What that does is the libraries become more relevant to the people whose needs they serve. For a library to be relevant to the people within communities like in developing areas, they might not necessarily need to do huge things in developing countries like cloud computing and access to internet because it's really a challenge. But I can tell you a small thing like having an SMS in a library where somebody can text in and check the availability of a book has changed the lives of people in a university in Ghana. As simple as that technology, that student who lives 100 or 200 meters away in town was to find out if that book prescribed by that lecturer is available in the library. And all he has to do is to send a text message to the library and say, is this book available? And if the process is not automated, he gets a call back. If the process is automated it, from a database point of view, it tells him really instantly whether that book is available. If it's not, when is it available? These are simple technologies that we have brought into libraries that has made them extremely relevant to the people's communities. And I can tell you the text messages are coming in for requests of how many books are available in the library and the availability of those books is amazing. This is how simple technology can be relevant to the people and how public-private partnerships with libraries is changing the lives of people in universities and in colleges. An extremely good example of, uh, of technology, how it can make a big difference, small technology. Um, what I think I'd like to do now is just uh, ask our remote moderators if there is anybody online who has a question or if anybody is currently following us. So. We are following by not so much attendees yet, and we have one question, but give me one minute, please. Okay. Two. What I'd also like to do then, um, because we've heard from each of our panelists, so it's probably a good point just to see if there's any reflection from those of you in the room. So um, I know we do have a roving microphone. Um, and do we have? Okay. Irina, can you pass the microphone down? Because I can see we have one question already. So if you can introduce yourself, and then if your question is to everybody on the panel, if you can let us know that, or if it's to an individual, or if it's a comment, that's fine. My name is Lydia, 
My name is Angela Nikwar and I represent IREX uh, here in Azerbaijan. IREX is an international media NGO. Um, we run a project funded by USAID and we do very similar work to you except we don't use libraries. So we just set up 20 community centers across Azerbaijan, all of them equipped with internet access and com computers and printers and scanners. We also just installed 30 internet kiosks which allow people to go and check their emails. These are uh, based in post offices. We have two problems. One of them is digital literacy. It's very hard to teach people how to use the internet. We found that over 72% of the people in the villages have never used the internet. But the biggest problem that we have of all is content. So I was wondering if you can give us some examples from other countries. How do you manage to create content in the lo local language? We just did our bit and we are creating now some resources for the um, university uh, students um, studying media, journalism, translating over 100 modules from English into Azerbaijani. But that's just a drop in the ocean. So what's the solution to that? Thank you. Barry, perhaps? I'll, I'll try to answer the first part of the question, uh, not the content, but how we approach helping people benefit from the internet. Um, I have found working in Romania especially that just saying come and learn a computer makes no sense to anybody. Um, but having a specific purpose, so if somebody needs to find a job and jobs are posted online and you teach them how to do that specific task, then they will slowly become accustomed with using computers, using software, and then using the internet. Um, we've also seen, for instance, a demographic in Romania that's not used to using the internet whatsoever, uh, farmers. And we've had, this year alone, 45,000 farmers go into a, a library, in our case, but they have gone in to get their farm subsidies because they can apply for farm subsidies online. So they have a vested interest. Um, so w what we try to do, and what we're looking at when it comes to first time internet use is identify something, whether it's a health related issue. Um, the elderly in Romania, for instance, one of the easiest ways to get them on a computer is to have them meet their family online, Skype. They get to meet their grandchildren, they get to Skype with them, and then they fall in love with the computers. Later on, they're blogging. Um, so, and, and these are true stories. Uh, and the blogging then becomes local content. Uh, so, I think really it's, yeah, there's lots of people who don't use the internet, but identifying what is of need to them helping them get through a, a, an important task for them will help introduce the, the technology, the software, and, and the internet in general. Um. Well, Dejan, you wanted to make a comment about local content. Okay, so I strongly believe that the adoption of the internet, computers, information technology is strongly tied to the existence of the local content because the local content is something that uh, creates the attractiveness and brings the ordinary citizen to sit in front of the iPad or the computer or the smartphone or whatever. Um, but the question is how to develop it. With all the information that today we have in the electronic way that sits on some servers and doesn't live anywhere. The question is how to bring that local content, how to structure it in a way that it is accessible to the ordinary citizen. And uh, you wouldn't mind, but there is a session on Friday, the panel 133, that is targeting this very topic. And um, I will be participating there, but I will lose, use the opportunity to make a remark on the local content and the creation as well. And again, I don't want to, um, to, uh, to bother anybody here, but again, the concept of cloud computing gives us the opportunity to do the following. Have the people who are skilled in the content creation and bring the public data using the so-called, we call it open data protocols, bring that data to the cloud from the servers that are scattered around the world in many governments, in many public sector communities, in many public communities, and let that data sit in a cloud and then have the ISVs, independent software vendors, developers, 
who would use that data and deliver that information through the cloud applications that can run on iPhones, on Android, on Windows phones, on iPads, on PC. This is the concept that we as an industry really promote today as a foot in the door for the cloud computing and as the way to, in a loosely coupled way, bring the public information that is dead on the servers to the cloud and make it available to the developers who know who they are targeting and with what information they are targeting. So that's a, a very uh, interesting tech solution. So we'll take, uh, did you want a question first, Christine? or And then we'll go to the remote question. Okay, that's good. That's good. We'll take that now. Maybe you could take the microphone. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone, and apologies for the pause while we were looking for the the microphone. I just wanted to follow up the conversation about content and mention that the the Internet Society and the OECD and UNESCO did a, a rather in-depth study looking at the relationship between local content, internet development and access prices and the full report is available on our website and I would encourage you all to read it. Uh, it really does look at the syn synergistic and the covariant and how these, these three things uh, are very intricately linked. I'd also just like to make a point about the cloud computing and, and cloud computing uh, offers great promise but one thing we do need to keep in mind is it is a complex area uh, particularly in economies that are still emerging where uh, power is an issue where uh, internet access is not guaranteed to be on 24 hours a day uh, so these are, are things that need to be thought of as in part of an overall strategy but definitely in terms of increasing local content, uh, literacy skills, uh, internet literacy, I ICT literacy, uh, access, physical access, and cheap prices are important elements. Thanks, Christine. So I think there was a gentleman with his hand up um, there. So if we can take the microphone and then we'll take the remote question because this might well be related to what we're currently discussing. There. All right. So uh, I'm Angelo Ramos. I'm from the Philippines. I work with an organization called the Philippine Community E-Center Network. So we're a network of telecenters in our country. So just in rep uh, response to your your, uh, your comment about uh, how these centers, like the ones you're running in Azerbaijan, might uh, be involved in content development. So we've had a similar experience in our country wherein we've um, developed uh, a training program or a workshop wherein we've identified some of our telecenters as content development hubs. So we've identified critical areas for content, localized content development, such as health, education, agriculture, livelihood, tourism. And uh, those uh, different centers have uh, basically uh, undergone Is it on? Yeah. So uh, we've gathered these uh, people from uh, different sectors in the community. I mean, for example, in uh, in agriculture, you know, you bring in uh, people from different sectors. You have the farmers, you have the agricultural experts, and even the IT experts. They come together as a group, and then they basically develop content on their own. So, if, for example, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be that everyone is IT literate. You just have to bring in from expert farmers who will tell them how how specific crops are planted, and then we have your you have your multimedia experts coming and helping out, and for example, doing video shoots or interviews in the field on how.
farmers do their agriculture practices. And they all come together, develop a script, develop a storyboard, and then you know they develop content uh, according to their needs. So they, some would develop a blog, some would uh, come up with a video that will that they'll put up on YouTube. And these are all developed uh, using the local language. So this is a very good way for communities to develop their own content, and this can be shared to the internet. Thank you. Yeah, one, one short one. Go on then. <laughs> okay, one short, quick, quick from uh, Olivier. Thank you. It's Olivier Crepin Leblanc for the transcript. Uh, just in, in response, actually adding to what the gentleman just uh, from the Philippines just said, the availability of open source software that is reliable and that is uh, ubiquitous and that you can use it worldwide and compatible with all the major formats is really important for content creation because in many developing countries, licenses are way too expensive for pri proprietary software. Thanks, Olivier. So, Irina, do we have a question from our remote participants? Yes, uh, we have a question from Michael from Thai Netizen Network from Bangkok. And he's asking whether there already are projects in place that bridge the digital divide and bring access to global knowledge to rural areas. And if so, where can we get information on that? Is it a clear question? That's a clear question. Um, I'm going to put that out to the panel and uh, see if someone wants to give us an example, really, of a project they've been involved in that is bridging the digital divide. Um, Kefu, do you have an example in Ghana, perhaps? Or yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, in Ghana, what we do is we have uh, a center we call the Open Digital Village. And what that does is that in every year, we put together a set of people who are volunteers into students who are on vacation, like high school students who are on vacation, and put them together for like a couple of, like four to six weeks. And what they do is have access to all the tools for ICT. And what is very interesting about that, that kind of scenario is that you do not use the IT experts to use your technical knowledge to teach the young ones IT, but you use like high school graduates who are very young kids and serve as role models for the colleagues and in the classroom to teach them very basic things that would help them to be functional literacy IT users in the community. So this is what is we're doing and it's being replicated in other regions as well so that people who on vacation can find something to do, the government is supporting, the local companies are supporting and the young kids are serving as role models for their own kids. And so what we do is just facilitate to create a platform for them to operate as a team and use the applications wisely. We call this one the Catch IT Young Project. Thank you. So I'd like to give two different examples of some programs that the Gates Foundation has supported, focusing on libraries, bridging the digital divide. The first is in Poland. And when people think of Poland, they often think of a country that is actually very well connected and everyone has access. And that's actually not the case. There are quite a few rural communities in Poland, much like many European Union countries, where people have no access to internet and did not have any access to digital information. And the program that we supported through public libraries was really targeting these communities. So these rural communities, these communities that uh, did not have the same advantages that some individuals in larger cities would have. And public libraries were the only way that people were getting access throughout these rural communities in Poland. Another example is in Chile, which has had all of their public libraries connected to the internet. And Chile is an interesting example because I'm sure many of you know the geography of Chile. It's a very long and narrow country with a lot of very isolated regions. And through public libraries, we had, for example, fishermen in remote areas of Chile who were able to access information on how to price their products and sell them on the market in a way that they had not been able to do before and in a way that in larger cities and larger countries, they had this information easily available already. But through the public library, they were able to access information in a new way and in a way that provided economic development opportunities that didn't exist before. Paul and Ari, yeah, there's, there's a couple of examples that come to mind in Europe as well. Um, in Great Britain, they have a, a thing called the Digital Champions Network, um, which is basically 
thousands of, of people who volunteer to help other people learn about getting online and using computers. Um, and what the government, together with private sector, has done is they have created the means for those volunteers to learn how to, to apply that, uh, or how to help guide those people. So if you don't have the skills to teach, you, you, you're basically given those skills. And, and so the entire nation right now is, is working. European Union also does a thing called like eSkills Week, which gets customized per country. And so each country then can go out and, and talk about the benefits of, of the internet and use of computers. And each country will adapt that type of program to their local needs and then promoting and, and bringing people to different public venues so that they can learn about the internet. <coughs> yeah, I think um, there have been many, many projects that have that have tried to bridge the digital divide in rural areas. I've been working in public access to the internet for more than a decade, and I've seen many of those projects come and go. And I think I think one of the reasons that that many of us here have have sort of coalesced around libraries is because libraries contribute something to that that conversation that many of those projects have been lacking, and that's that's sustainability. Um, often these uh, often rural kind of connectivity or, or rural access projects are wonderful projects that that create uh, um, that that address that that issue of the the, the lack of access. Um, but often once that project funding is finished, the the resources disappear, and that's been a a, a challenge that this field has grappled with for a long time. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we see libraries is kind of answering that question is because whether they're under-resourced uh, or not, libraries exist uh, in so many places and they have an existing place in the uh, government bureaucracy. They have an existing budget line. They have a librarian's salary that's paid. It's probably not enough, but it's there. Um, and so once uh, an investment is made in uh, improving the librarian skills in equipping the, the library with modern technology that that investment's going to provide dividends for many years to come it's going to stay there whereas a one-off project is far more likely to dissipate after the funding has disappeared uh, thank you mr chair it's olivier crepe leblanc for the transcript um, I, I just wanted to focus on one project, uh, which actually is very much akin to uh, the project of mobile libraries, uh, where you have a truck or a bus that is outfitted with shelves and people can uh, contact in advance and say, well, I'd like to read this or that or obtain information on this or, or, or that uh, subject. And then the bus uh, or the truck drives over to the area, to the remote rural area and uh, makes the library available on the doorstep of the people who require it. There are similar projects in place uh, for the internet. I've heard of, of several of them uh, where a bus would drive into a village with pretty good internet connectivity. I'm not quite sure whether it's satellite or whether it's by microwave or whatever system, but it remains in the village for a good six to ten days and lets the villagers uh, and, and people who usually are very far from technology, uh, apart from the odd uh, mobile phone mast, uh, but are able to actually make use of, of, the, uh, of the technology. And not only that, but the schools are able to make use of that technology. And that's really important. Uh, looking around the room, I'm, I'm always, um, not only here, but at every one of our meetings, I'm always um, so uh, unhappy of the fact that the majority of people uh, sitting around, myself included, have white hair and um, beards also, many of them. Uh, many of us, uh, should I say, and uh, you know, it really the internet is for the next, uh, it's the next generation, uh, and so schools need that access, that essential access. School teachers in rural uh, parts of the world are not really equipped to uh, know about the internet because they themselves have not been uh, brought uh, to use it, and so the, the uh, concept of having a mobile library or mobile internet uh, bus is something that is very, very beneficial for them. Uh, did Christine, did you have a point first? Okay, Trevor? Okay, to, to help Michael, um, he can go to the Ghana website, the, the GIFEC, G-I-F-E-C, dot gov dot gh gifrec dot gov dot gh this is a project about 10 mobile libraries across the country in ghana and one of them has been supported with our partnerships with ifel that those buses go to the communities 
and they they pack they live in the community for like a day or two and they have computers on board they have books on board and the kids come around and the schools come around to use this technologies and they do reading sometimes in the classroom sometimes under trees and the challenge with those things is that when they get to communities where there's no power then those computers cannot be used the only what the kids get to use is the books that are on board so what we did with IFL was when IFL's funding we got laptops instead of desktops on those the buses we got like the Intel classmates and some laptops that could last for a long time and then we also got a solar panel and fix it on top of the bus so as the bus drives off from the regional city into the rural area it charges it charges all the laptops on the road and when they get to the community we take one of those boxes provided by the government and the solar panel powers that desktop and we got an e-granary that's the digital library with over several millions of content we'll, what we did innovatively was to put a wireless on top of that e-granary and so when it gets into the community that solar panel the charges the laptops now powers the e-granary digital library and that computer and the wireless network and stays in the community and so not only the kids with that laptop can work for eight hours and the trees within like a hundred meters radius so all we do is to pack the car where at least there are no trees to have interruption with the wireless network and have people just sit anywhere and we configure it to have access to the digital library one people in rural areas don't have access to internet they can't pay for it but they browse with those laptops into the digital library as if they're browsing their internet. So not only are they having access to content, but they're learning how to use their internet without knowing what it is. They're learning how to use their browsing, they're getting the videos, they're getting the text pages, they're doing the research, but they don't know that it's not internet. They feel like it's internet. So if two years down the lane they get into the big cities, it feels like, hey, this is what we're doing. And that partnership for me, it's one thing that has changed the face. And the government is beginning to look at that prototype project we're doing right now and say, can we replicate it in all the regions? Can we fix the solar panels? Can we use laptops instead of a desktop? Can we use rugged computers with long battery lifespan so the kids can learn? So that's one project that is really, really you know, dear to our heart here. Mm -hmm. So I know that some of our panelists have uh, more comments, but I think we'll go back to the floor. There's a question I know just here. So we'll see what, uh, see what we have here. Hi, uh, my name is Emila Gandhi. Uh, I work with the Association for Progressive Communications and I'm an Internet Society Ambassador. My question is directed to uh, Beyond Access. And uh, you mentioned that um, uh, you are a coalition of org uh, nine organizations uh, promoting public uh, libraries as partners in development goals. What I just wanted to find out is um, what are the challenges that you are facing? Uh, I'm imagining that you also, you, you don't only empower libraries uh, to save the, uh, you know, as development partners, but you also maybe work with uh, policy makers. What are the challenges uh, that, that you are facing uh, working with government or policy makers? What are those challenges and uh, how are you dealing with them? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty complicated question because there's, there's a lot of ways to answer it. But I, I can tell you a few things um, that, uh, that have been uh, uh, most relevant. Um, so the, the first challenge is about perceptions. And I think some members of our, our panel already, already mentioned that issue. But um, that, you know, the, the Eiffel study last year uh, certainly confirmed uh, what I think we, we had predicted, but um, uh, many people consider libraries an outdated institution, and they consider it to be about books and kids. Um, and so when we start talking about uh, libraries, modern libraries relevant for the 21st century, that takes a big leap. Uh, it requires a big leap on the part of, of policymakers in, in understanding um, that, that new role for libraries. Um, and we tried to address that through a number of ways. I mean, it's a, it's a long-term advocacy uh, uh, initiative, and you know, part of it is, is events like this, where we, we talk about 
uh, the different ways that libraries are contributing to, to development goals. Um, it's, it's also about, uh, when we talk about specific countries, it's about local relevance. Um, and, you know, so each, each country and each community has its, own, um, has its own way of talking about development goals. Um, it's interesting. We, so uh, a couple of people have mentioned the Beyond Access conference that, uh, that took place last month in Washington, D.C. And at that conference, we got together, uh, we got together library uh, representatives and government uh, officials from about 35 countries. And, and uh, uh, during one session, we had this, this uh, mix in the room. And uh, representatives of government were, were, you know, they were starting to see this, this potential that perhaps they, they had missed in, in library infrastructure, but the, uh, a point that, was re that consensus was reached around was librarians need to learn to, to speak in the terms of, uh, of national development plans. So every country has its own sort of um, uh, policies and documents that explain what the development goals are, whether those are in health or in agriculture and digital inclusion or, 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 or social inclusion. Uh, or youth empowerment or, or, or uh, women's empowerment. Um, and libraries traditionally haven't been talking about what they do in those terms. Libraries have traditionally uh, explained what they do in terms of how many books they've lent and how many people have visited. And so that's a, that's a big leap that needs to be made on the part of the, of the library community and starting to, to describe their impact uh, and their activities in, in the, s the same terms that, that national planners use to uh, describe their their goals and where they want to get at, and so it's it's really about bridging that perceptions gap uh, and that communication gap, so that uh, both sides can see where the value in cooperation is. So I might just uh, ask Sange, as as somebody from the government in Bhutan, um, you've just heard what Ari has to say there. Does that chime with what you, as a as a government representative, as somebody involved in policy, is that what you want from us? Because of course this workshop's trying to get at what policymakers want from libraries and other community services. So what, what do you want from us? Um, my experience or expectations at the Beyond Access, which was the first for me, and now this one is uh, really uh, in sharing my own experiences, also learning from others. And I think uh, I see a big role for library, public libraries. And for a place, uh, Bhutan, where we've, we have a lot of library, but these are not public library. These are all limited to school libraries. And so uh, when you talk about perception, the general perception in my country is that libraries are uh, a place where you go and read books, borrow books, but very, very limited to schools. And so uh, the idea I get from the discussions you know, starting from the Beyond Access Conference and now is that um, libraries, the new libraries model ha models have to merge. Uh, li libraries can be much more than just books. Uh, also, um, in terms of uh, literacy, when you talk about poor literacy, how libraries could be used to not only um, encourage people to read for literacy uh, education and you know um, widening the understanding, but also people who are not in the school, but in the sense a non-formal, uh, out-of-school education programs, and a lot of material in the library could be used for that. And um, so, I mean, my expectation from the conferences here is that um, uh, libraries the emerging role of libraries could be better explained so that people could come back and you know they try and explore within the resources that we have as to how we could adopt the library to uh, issue address issues that are uh, have emerged now since you know the beginning of how libraries were perceived uh, that's one second is uh, something that I'm working on is um, after the Washington conference and between now is uh, a lot of times libraries are mostly about texts and scripts where people with literacy problems cannot really take advantage of. And I think really I'm looking at audio and visual, a section in the library which would be more uh, uh, engaging for people who don't know how to read, right? And so, um, for instance, uh, I'm looking at a possibility of, um, as, a, as a result of the exposure to the forum, that is, um, where the local government proceedings would be recorded by a simple camera, a telephone camera, and everybody carries one. And that would be deposited at a repository in the library. And any local person who doesn't know how to read and write, who doesn't know how to read uh, newspapers, and because the place is very small, there are no newspapers, and the television wouldn't cover it because it's very isolated, 
And so the local people really do not uh, have an understanding of how the local government is functioning and how it affects them. And so in a sense, I see a possibility and a cheap alternative is if people could record it on the phone and then have a repository in the library and on a simple computer where people could just walk in and want to play the video again of local government proceedings and know what representative said what and what were the policies discussed and what was the outcome. So I think this is, this is a really simple, uh, probably achievable, but something which could really change the way how uh, grassroots engagement in terms of decision making ca could change what the new uh, definition or facelift that library could receive. So that's a, a pretty positive way to bring us almost to the end of the session. We did start a little bit late, so what I'd like to do is offer our panelists uh, just very brief if you have any closing remarks, and we'll start with Dejan, 30 seconds or so, there may be something you've heard that, that you want to comment on before we leave. Um, thanks. Because I come from the technology company and because I did speak about the opportunity of cloud and there was a remark on cloud, um, I want to make sure that I'm clear to everybody here because uh, it is this group of people that needs to promote the concept of digital libraries, including the technologies behind. So w with regard to the cloud, the idea of the cloud is really to put it in a highly developed country like the United States or Canada or Ireland or Western Europe, completely outsource that infrastructure to those countries that actually have the computing power, have the water to cool down the data centers, have the technical people that will deal with that infrastructure, but bring the content to the other side of the world into the developed countries and not require them to have the server infrastructure. They don't need anything other than access to the internet and those classmates that you spoke about. The whole power of the library is on the other side of the world. So that is the, the promise of the cloud. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you. The, I'd like to address the issue of the advocacy because uh, I belong to the African Awareness Raising Group um, for Public Libraries, supported by IFIL. Their politicians, some of the challenges that we're facing in Ghana are getting politicians to change their perception is that first and foremost, through the research done by IFIL, many people in Ghana see libraries as a place to store books and just to read books. And this is a fact. Even without the research, it, it's true, okay? And therefore, this is fed into the minds of politicians. So one of the things we, we're trying hard to debunk in the mind of politicians is the fact that libraries are not just places for storage of books and reading. It's difficult to do, but we're working on it. The second thing is that we're not getting political commitment because whether the libraries exist or not, whether the politicians support the libraries or not, they still can get their votes by doing other development projects in the community that people will see. So the politician does not know, does not feel like the library is, is important to him because it's been there and he's been in power, his people have voted for him again, but he's done nothing about it, nobody's asking him anything. So why does he put attention? And politicians react to people who put a lot of pressure on them. So if the librarians are not putting a lot of pressure, if the awareness raising groups, if we as a team are not putting pressure on government, their perceptions will not change. And I'm so excited to hear what you said, that ascending beyond access and this conference, you're beginning to do simple things like that. And this is a fact, that politicians don't prioritize libraries. So I think we need to push in a little bit of effort. And what we're doing in Ghana is training the librarians to ask for more, and we're pushing them to say the stories. And a simple thing we're doing is getting the politician, there's one politician who is a member of the team, we're getting their numbers, and we're sending them success stories by SMS, simply telling them what libraries are doing, the great things they're doing, and that we hope will change the perceptions of our libraries. Thank you. So, Olivia, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you all to be quite brief as we wind down. Sorry. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's Olivia for the transcript, and asking me to be brief is going to be hard. I'll try and be very brief. Um, I think that the focus, really, that, that I've heard here uh, is with regards to the uh, digital divide 
uh, which has to be narrowed. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a, a case of moving goalposts. Uh, originally, it was who can access the Internet, who cannot access the Internet. Now it's down to speed. It's down to how much multimedia content you can achieve to have. Now it's down to finding the content, or rather making the content, and then making that content accessible, because if you can't find the content, then people would be demoralized in creating it. So um, libraries have a real strong role to play in this, um, not only because they know how to classify content, how to make it accessible, how to make it available, um, but also because uh, they are also have the means, the, the technical facilities, uh, to be able to access more multimedia content than just access through a mobile phone. Uh, it's a constant race uh, that, that goes on, and if uh, libraries can play their role in this uh, and um, bridge the divide or, or at least try to narrow it as much as it can, uh, then uh, I think it, uh, libraries have an enormous amount of work in front of them, and uh, the time to start is today. So I would actually challenge us not to ask, or not to focus specifically on the digital divide, or ask the question, how do we overcome the digital divide? But how do we identify the needs of a community and help a community address those challenges? And I think we've heard some really great examples from Bhutan and Ghana in particular of creative, practical solutions, some more complex and higher tech, some honestly pretty easy that can meet community needs. And I think that there's a role for libraries in that process, but it's what is the need and how can we find a solution? Um, I'm gonna come back to the question earlier a little bit in, in, in dealing with government. Uh, and what's sort of the greatest challenge. I, I think very often the greatest challenge uh, is, is nothing to do with libraries, is the fact that governments will not acknowledge that facing the digital divide is essential today, where in Europe we know that eight out of 10 jobs in the next few years will be dependent on digital literacy. We know that economic and social development is going to be completely dependent on content that's generated online, e-services that are produced, and if we can't get governments to acknowledge that this aspect is essential in public policy, and then how we use libraries or other facilities to bridge the gap, uh, then we the, the, the problem will, will persist, so. Yeah, um, I would just add to this conversation that I, I think uh, librarians need to have and demand a seat at the table when, when these issues are discussed on the national and local level. Uh, traditionally, librarians haven't been called upon to contribute to policies on the digital divide or on all of these other development issues and, and areas we've been talking about. They've either been absent completely from the policy discussion or pigeonholed into education or, or literacy. And I think it's time that uh, librarians were part of these discussions on the national level. I'm done. So, um, where librarians are all persons is connected to libraries, uh, gathering here, discussing something, uh, uh, sharing our problems, experience, etc. Uh, but uh, yesterday, Stuart said um, one idea uh, I liked very much uh, let's be everywhere. Uh, sometimes we are ignored by policymakers, by government. Uh, like something that uh, exists and it must exist and do uh, its work. But let it be everywhere and let uh, them hear our voice, our needs, then maybe we can uh, manage uh, in our development and do more things. Thank you. So before we go, Irina, was there any further comments from anyone in the remote participants? We can't take questions, but we can, we can hear the questions and all go away and think about them, I think. No questions? No questions no from questions? the comments? Okay, Any co so do you want to read uh, some of the comments? We have one question from Michael, can we? Another Again, question from Michael. Well, we can hear it, we won't be able to answer it, but if you, if you speak it to us, we can uh -huh. take it away. Okay, uh, I will say only one comment from Thailand again, but from another person, uh, from Clay Kong. Uh, he was talking about uh, important role library of a library uh, in social networks because a lot of young people in Thailand is using social networks for getting information 
So it is important to to be collaborate in social networks, to improving library services. Okay, to so get important to be visible okay. in the social to be visible. network. So that brings us to the end. Before we go, I want to mention two things because um, there's obviously a lot to discuss in this issue and to give ourselves a bit more space to do that, we have formed a dynamic coalition within the IGF and the first meeting of the dynamic coalition on public access through libraries takes place on Thursday, 2.30 in this same room. So for those of you who are interested in exploring this a bit more, probably without headphones and microphones, I think we'll have a more of an informal meeting. That's 2.30 in this room on Thursday. And secondly, Ari mentioned the importance of libraries stating their position on access to information for women, for children, cloud computing, internet governance. So we do have a brief on why libraries are important for public access. And if you go to beyondaccess.net, you can find that brief available. It's a four page PDF and it gives you the talking points as to why we feel this is an important issue. So I wonder if those of you in the room, if you've enjoyed yourselves, if you could give a round of applause for our panelists and thank you very much. That was the weirdest thing <laughs> ever. <laughs>